as an actor, you hear no all the time. You get rejected all the time. It can beat you down. You need to get a tough, thick skin. We're going to talk about that today. Acting Class Weekly with legendary character actor Sean Whelan. Lessons, tips, and insight into the craft and business of acting from a man who's been directed by the likes of Spielberg, Eastwood, Tim Burton, Ang Lee, Michael Bay, Wes Craven, Tom Hanks, and many more of Hollywood's A-List. He is 30 years an actor and your professor, Sean Whelan. Now, Roxy... We've been talking about jackets for the last few weeks. Today, <laughs> I'm wearing the very nurturing, comforting sweater because we're going to be talking about some tough things, but not in a hopeless way, in a very hopeful way. So I felt like my uh, Robin Williams and Goodwill Hunting type sweater my could, help, could help people through. Best Sha- Robin Williams performance? I think so. Uh, besides she- Awakenings. Sorry. Mm, Mm. Give it to me. I think that, Sean, as the professor as well, this is a very professory look. You've got your glasses on. You've got your sweater. You're definitely teaching an artsy course somewhere. You're ready for it. And And we're talking about emotion, and we're talking about mental health today. And this is a tough business, guys. It's crazy. We get barraged from so many different things just with scheduling, but then personal you know we are a business so when they're criticizing your business they're criticizing it feels like they're criticizing you and 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 it can really beat people down plus it's just known artistic people creative people have more tendencies towards some mental illness or fragility as i would say maybe anxiety depression and so we're going to talk about how to make it through today uh, with really hands-on tips that can make it through uh, this crazy business. And as always, with me to discuss this is Miss Phenomenal. Hello, Sean. And, you know, you have to grasp your phenomenality. Phenomenalness. Phenomenalness. It, to make it through, right? Mm-hmm. When challenging times. Definitely. And, Self love, baby. And, and Mr. Fen- Fun Tabulous. I uh, think embracing I, my fantabulosity. Yes, every of co- week. Of course, because if you let that slip, you can get sucked into the muck and mire. Also uh, known as Jeff Graham. Uh, also for known those, as Jeff. For those common right. folk. That's true. The also common folk, Jeff, yes. Our producer, Jeff Graham. So uh, we are going to talk about all that today. But before we get into it, I'm going to do a very quick, because we have a lot to talk about, Sean's Week. Are you ready? One, two, three. Sean's, Sean's Week. week. I kind of missed Mr. Fontamulus. Now I, I felt he was like a do door it every was time. open. And you even counted I, us in. He's teasing well, I us. Can, a I, I bit. felt like last week I might have overstepped by joining. Oh, I just wasn't sure. But so is I'm, that a useful thing to think about? See? That, and actually, it was a detrimental thing to think right. about. Right. And it hindered your cur- uh, courageousness today to jump in. Mm. That's true. We're, We're going to talk it. about he that. He needs see? these tips, clearly. We're going to get you some tips today. Uh, before we dive in, oh, I think. Your, your Besides week. this, well, it's so amazing. Our sing today's singing was pretty amazing. Thank you. That I think I've kind of been washed over and forgot all about my week. <laughs> but I will dive in. Guys have been talking about the movie Crust, the horror comedy, and this is going to be news to uh, Roxy and Jeff, who have both read crust and uh this is the movie that sean wrote that i wrote it's and a he's horror working comedy on producing working on producing it um and like i said they both read it they told me they enjoyed it and i will take that compliment tip mental tip and be happy with it uh i have trouble with independent movies it's always tough raising the money people say they want to help you then they don't a friend of mine came to me he's going to do an anthology three half hour movies of fun horror comedy things 30 minutes each so three short movies put together into one feature yes um like the twilight zone in the 90s and other movies and they want crust to be a segment and it's the most realistic way for me to shoot it get it done but man i have to cut 60 pages to get it down there but it's it at least gets it done gets the brand out there i can use the money that's already been raised so it's kind of exciting news. It was hard because at first you go, oh, I got to cut my baby. But it doesn't mean that's done. If this short version does really well, I can always do the feature. It's almost like a longer proof of concept. Yes, exactly. So I'm excited, you know, when my partner and I are starting actually tonight to I think that's cut that blood on the floor. Incrustable. 
That's wow. That's that's really good. Thank you. That's really good, Mr. Thank Funtabulous. So how did you feel about that? I felt great. I got a little nostalgic because uh, if you guys have ever had Uncrustables before, <laughs> that's like uh, Roxy's oh, a camper. Yes. You might know they are yes. prepackaged peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and, so. and yes. they're pretty good. They're I pretty good. Say. Yes. Yeah. See, and I could have gotten okay. So we're going to use this as our example today. I could have gotten insecure with you guys changing the subject from un- uh, my movie to like a memory thing and thinking, oh, well, my movie wasn't important, and I could go down a dark road. But I'm going to or u- we're, right. But we're going to use that as our example today because I was thinking I, I need an example. That's a perfect example. Great, and we'll use that today. So let's first. Find out about why it's important for you guys to give our mental health and feedback uh, a little bit of love uh, after Buzz TV. Absolutely. And you know, something that helps with uh, mental uh, Mm -hmm. things (laughs) is this amazing (laughs) song that we're about to hear. Yeah. That's going to under. So lift you up. Exactly. I was just waiting for it. Mm-hmm. Mental things. So there you go. Guys, here at After Buzz <laughs> TV, we do coverage for all different kinds of shows, from your favorite TV shows to shows like the Acting Class Weekly. We're covering so many different things. And the way we're able to do that is by you guys being super fans of us. So if you are a super fan, don't forget to rate, comment, subscribe. Why do those things matter? If you comment, it helps us say what we're going to talk about on our show. We also like to know where your thoughts are, what you're enjoying about it, what you're not enjoying about it. But hopefully more enjoying and also uh subscribing and rating make sure that more people can find our show that's the way the algorithm algorithm Algorithm. work algorithms uh clearly i am from the creative side of things and not from the math (laughs) side of things so uh algorithms not totally my thing but that's what i'm told by the the people who run the youtubes and the podcasts of the world so rating comment subscribing that will make sure that this show runs for a long time and there are some people who have done so already and we want to give special shout outs to them so every Every single week on this show, we actually read a comment or two from people who have written in on YouTube or on Apple Podcast. I'm actually only going to read one this week because it's a lengthy one, but it's awesome. And it's one that I've been holding off on because, Sean, this is from almost a year ago. Wow. So this is somebody who has been a longtime listener. Okay. This is from Alyssa, uh, and the title of this is Pod Bless Sean. (laughs) Pretty clever. Wow. We, We love a good pun here. Yes. She says, Here's the deal. Sean Whalen is teaching a workshop at my acting studio soon, which is how I learned of his podcast. Being a 16-year-old with no source of income, the workshop seems out of my reach. But after one listen to this podcast, I'm frantic to find a way to attend. Frantic, I tell you. Like begging my parents (laughs) for cash in vain, frantic. If you're an actor or simply want to be one, this is a must-listen without a doubt. Sean is down to earth, honest, and real. There's a lot of capitalized words in this, by the way. Wow. This man's famous noggin is clearly stuffed with knowledge <laughs> only a true professional could have. The exact kind of knowledge any actor will crave, the way he teaches in this delight of a pod, is easily digestible and worth every second of listening. Wow. He has the vibe of an experienced friend giving you advice on thriving in that oh so intimidating machine that we call. The business. Please, actors, give your sweet ears the treat of soaking in the dire information Sean gives. They deserve it. Trust me, you'll find yourself re listening again and again. Did I only discover this podcast yesterday? Yes. Did I have way too much fun writing this review? Yes, of course. <laughs> Am I overhyping the show? Absolutely not. Listen to the dang cast. Peace out. Wow. So we're doing a mental health episode today, Sean. I hope this was good for your mental health that because was, uh, clearly uh, a super fan. Yeah. And Alyssa, we really appreciate you. Sorry really it took me so long to read your comment. It. Love it. Love Thank that. you so, so much. Um, yeah, that feels good to feel that what you're doing is getting a positive response. But I'm going to say this right off the bat. The majority of the time, it doesn't happen that way. And it isn't because of you. And so we're going to explain. So first of all, I said at the top, creative people are prone to anxiety and depression. It's just because we're more sensitive. That's our art form. We have to be more sensitive and affected. And you're putting yourself out there more than You're putting yourself things. out there personally. You know, if you do a report and they don't like your report, yes, of course, it feels a little bit of rejection of you. But when you're doing acting and it's your face, your movements, everything, it's, it's a full-on personal rejection, or it feels so. Or it feels that 
anyway. So what are the th- I'm going to do a commercial vibe, which is we're going to say the problem and then we're going to hit you with the solutions. Need that not just commercial, but in life. If you can identify the problem, you're halfway there. And yes. now, Sean, I'm glad that you're here to provide some solutions. That might yeah. not work for everybody all the time, but nope. here are things that have worked for you, I'm assuming. Absolutely. So what can this what can this manifest itself? So people are trying to figure out what that means with the constant rejection or not living up to your expectations. It can manifest as you're in your head too much. You think you overthink things. Uh, you get nervous before everything, but not in a good way, but in a detrimental way. Uh, Perfectionism, you have to make sure everything's lined up. And if some little thing goes wrong, you spin out of control. Overanalyzing everything that happens in your acting class, talking about it forever ad nauseum and not getting anywhere. Overanalyzing auditions, you walk away, you can't stop thinking about it. You're, you know, up at night, you're checking your phone constantly. Um, Personalizing the rejection, feeling that it's not that you don't fit the role, they don't like me. That's another way it can uh, affect you. And always, always seeking reassurance and approval. These are all ways that I have seen and they've majority of these things happened to me when I was in you know starting out feeling all of these things it's totally normal but if they're twinges that's something but if it becomes overwhelming and hinders you in your class hinders you in your auditions then it needs to be addressed and of course it builds because the longer right. you're out here, it's the more rejection you get, not the less. The more right. things you're going in for. And it's interesting about sensi- being sensitized or being, you know, uh, so, what's, so what would be the one is getting more affected, one is getting tougher, right? Sensitized. Jeff's and, a writer. Jeff. Yeah. Callous? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, kind, well, kind of ca- or thick, getting the thick skin where you're not. I thought there was two verbs of sensitive. It was sensitized. Desensitized. And, desensitized. Oh, yes, I see yes, going. exactly. So I was going to say sensodyne, which is good for your teeth. That's a di- and, and cold, cold ice while chewing mm, it. That's mm-hmm. when that's good. All right. Similar. So bef- um, the also. There's a thing with if you have all of these things that I just read, all these symptoms, and you keep doing them, it's what is called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness is because the way you're thinking makes you feel like you can't accomplish anything. And your mind and the way you process things are the way that you feel helpless. Not from facts or what's actually happening to you, but how you process it. And three very dangerous things of um, taking uh, things that happen to you in your life or something that happens in an audition are there's three ways to process things that are not useful or helpful. One is personalizing it, like I just said. I didn't get that part on that audition. They hate me. They don't like me. They think I'm a terrible actor. That's taking it personally. Um, Pervasiveness. I didn't get that audition, so now... um, I'm, I'm a terrible actor. I'm probably the worst boyfriend in the world. I can't take care of my kids. I can't be a good family member. I'm just awful at everything. So it permeates. And then permanence, which means I'm a terrible actor. I didn't get that job. I will never be a good actor. Why continue? So, pers- so three Ps. Three Ps. Personalizing it. Pervasive, meaning it uh, encompasses everything and permanent. It will never get better. These are all three very core issues or core ways to think that will ensure that you learn to be helpless. So you can't get out of this. So this happened to me in a very major way after my divorce. Um, I was actually fine. We had split in a way that was amicable. Everything was fine. And then when things changed and I loved the holidays and I loved... Um, Being in my house for the holidays, I lost my house, and I was with my kids half the time, and we had some financial issues, and I went through a very tough time for six months, and I 
have a book that I'm going to talk about that helped me and some therapy and those this is all what I learned in the therapy and those in that book that really pulled me out of that depression that lasted like six months. I lost a ton of weight. I got down to like 121 pounds. It was really bad. Sean, which one of those personal, pervasive, or permanent do you relate to the most when uh, you are feeling your, at your darkest? I think it for me it was um, personalizing it. I personalized everything. And the worst, when I was at my worst of anxiety and depression, I would text somebody and be terrified when they didn't text me back in a reasonable time. I thought they were looking at it, judging me. It was just all, you know, it was all bad thinking. And um, I was very upset when my therapist and my brother, who I love dearly, said, you know, change the way you think, it'll change everything. And I thought, how dare you say that? Because, guys, when we suffer from anxiety or depression, it feels like there's no way it's that easy. And it isn't. It's work. It's just like going in the, it's just like saying, hey, I want to be in shape to run a uh, marathon. Well, that's not easy either. And so you have to put in a lot of work. So you have to put in some diligent, everyday work. And I'm going to give you those tips right now. So number one thing that helped me the most in my acting and in my life was to see life as what it actually is, a series of moments. You can make up trends in your life that would be pervasiveness or permanence. You can make up, say, oh, this will never get better, and it affects everything, which isn't true. And it's really important that you argue with your friends or put in your mind when you have a problem to keep it only with that specific moment. So you didn't do well in your acting class, and your teacher was hard on you. That's all it was for that moment. And so what I, to teach you this, I taught my daughter this when she was ruminating a lot. And ruminating means anything you think about longer for a minute that's that's useful or not useful. If I ruminated on how much I love doing this After Buzz TV show every night for an hour and a half, that would be fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. It makes you feel good. But if you ruminate negatively, that's not really good. So the opposite of ruminating is moment to moment. So what you can do is when you're thinking of something and you know it's negative and you're driving or walking, um, you can put it visually on a tree. Put or, what visually? Uh, your problem. Visualize your problem as something. Let's say it's like an ugly black blotch. Put it on the tree and drive by it and let everything just pass by. Just pass by moment to moment to moment. And then you don't get mired in it and just feel it going away. And get really used to that. And if you can't do that, if you're sitting somewhere still, do the same thing visually. Close your eyes, see it, and let it just pass by you. And just see things as moments. Roxy and I have had misunderstandings like right before the show goes on. I remember we were discussing something about a different show that you were confused why I was talking about, whatever. And then, boom, we got into it. And then afterwards, we didn't even really mention it. I think that's really good about our relationships as friends and as business people. We literally don't stay in it. Yeah. We just don't. We Which just move through it. Which is something that was a learned behavior for sure. Which is a learned behavior. You have to do the work. Moment to moment is really important. Also, when I was doing a play last year... I screwed up my line, like my first line. Now, if I didn't let that go, it would have ruined the rest of the show. But I went, oh, I screwed that up. Oh, well. And so when you are doing that, Sean, if you're on stage, are you literally pa like thinking for a second, okay, let that go, but I made it like a tree? Or uh, how are you, or are you good at this point enough that... I, I, I take a breath. The breath kind of blows it away because things aren't moving past me. I'll take a breath. You can also do that. Just blow it away. Just, and then... And then luckily, because I'm in a show, I have new things to focus on. Right. You can redirect. That's the other part of it. Let the moment pass and then redirect onto something else immediately to fill that void. So moment to moment, that's really, really important. And I explain the difference between rumination and thinking. You understand the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So hand me, push that piece of paper my way. And that's all I that you didn't have to think about that. You didn't have to go, oh, my God, I have to put my hand on top of it. Oh, my God, I have to put you just did it. Mm -hmm. That's thinking. And ruminating would be everything I just did, okay? So also the first thing I'm going to tell you to do is get a notebook. I call it my no-sweat notebook. Which means you can't sweat on it. Can't sweat on it. No. See, you're being literal. And I'm going to criticize that and say, 
No, like the terminology. No sweat, like yeah. life's no easy. Worries. No worries. Hakuna Matata. Hakuna Matata, exactly. So the no sweat notebook. So carry it with you everywhere. Have it in your backpack. Most people have some sort of bag or backpack or something, if, especially if you're an actor. Um, and you're going to use it to write some very useful things. The first thing, if this is one of the problems or issues that you have, let's write against your need for approval from authority figures. For instance, your acting teacher. Okay? I'm not doing as well. I went from Groundlings where I was killing it, and then I went into um, the uh, Playhouse West, and it was tougher. He was much tougher. I wasn't just, you know, flying through it. And it was tough on me. It was hard because I was like the big fish in a big pond. I mean, at the Groundlings, you know, you, I was doing really, really well there. And to get that criticism, and, you know, it takes the kind of moment to moment thinking plus kind of writing down and they say that writing down is one of the strongest ways to remember something and I don't know why I think it's because it's a full you know thought into your action and literal into the muscle writing. memory like literal muscle memory yeah so you write down something that is useful and true for example let's say your teacher's being hard on you consistently well you can write this person is helping me learn a craft. The more I work on the craft, the better I'll do. If he or she does not support me, there are a million classes in town. So you could write something like that. And guess what? Write it every time you feel. Can you give another example, Sean? Of approval. Um, the director did not come over and say that I was a really great actor in my scene okay and i got to be and i had to go and he didn't see me so you but would write down i would write down he the director is a very busy person he has many things on his plate not just my scene so maybe he just didn't have the time to come over and see me i think if i did a bad job he would have come and corrected me so it's just kind of not having other people guide you, you know, and, and guide the way you feel. You have to take ownership of what you feel and what you don't feel and, and how you react. This has been a common theme for years. People have talked about it. It's not what happens to you. It's how you react to it. But when you're in a bad place, it's easier to react in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another thing that I think is really useful and really helpful is perspective. Perspective. Now, what does that mean? Perspective means that I am really freaked out that I didn't get a callback for that Disney Channel audition, and I'm freaking out about it. Well, it was great because one time my mom had said, well, you know, I was telling her something griping about something like that, and my mom just said, listen, you had you know, a divorce when you were a very young kid, you had to move around a lot, you were tiny and sometimes got picked on. You've gone through a lot worse than this. So it's perspective of your own life or, or do you sometimes your... say like there's a genocide going on yes. across the world right. and uh, right. slavery happened not even too long ago and, right. or do you only... I find it useful to personalize it because what it is feeding you is that I am strong. So think of three specific things that were really hard in your life. In your own life. In your right? or life that made you stronger, that you got through it, that you, you know, you survived it and not only survived it, but possibly even thrived. And for example, yes, my parents got divorced when I was very young. I was only three. I didn't really even know my father in terms of him living in our house. And uh, he moved to San Francisco when I was a kid, and I missed him a lot. There was a time when I was very boyish and wanted my dad, and he wasn't around. And But I got through all of it. We made our peace. You know, I ended up coming to California, and he was in San Francisco, and we spent some fun time together, bring my friends up there. But I got through it. And so I can look back and so say, 
you know, if I was writing mine, I could say, you know, I had a dad that wasn't around most of my childhood. But I got through it, and I'm, you know, have a happy love life with my girlfriend. I have lovely children. So, what, and, and you're writing down all of that. You're writing no, down. No, yeah, I would just write down whatever your trigger would be. Like my dad was absent when I was kid, and I, when I was a kid, and I'm doing very well. And then say, you know, I would say, hey, I survived a very tough divorce. Now I would say I went through six months where I was so depressed and anxious I never knew how I would function again. But I got through it, you know, so writing this thing. So if you had to write down one thing from your life that you had to get through, what would it be? Well, obviously, the the go-to for any member of the DPC would be that my mom passed away and I'm okay. still here. So yeah. that usually gets to be on the top of my yeah. I got through it list. Right. I have, I have other ones. <laughs> oh, everybody does. Right. Mr. Funtabulous, do you have one that you consider uh, important that you got through? You know, my... Uh... And actually just passed away. And that's mm-hmm. been kind of tough. Um, right. But, you know, I, I went back for the memorial and I've really kind of been processing through. I think I'm actually, to be honest, still kind of in the middle of it. But I right. know, you know, after it, it I'm going to be able to get through it. So Right. Yeah. So everybody, everybody has something. And then when you put that against, I didn't get a call back for Disney Channel. Seems a little I'm like, hmm, that's OK. My old acting teacher used to say when we were, we would do a scene. Her name was Janet Alhanty and she... This one girl was just like, I'm so sorry, I'm so nervous. And she turned to us and said, none of you are waiting for a phone call from a doctor giving you the results of a fatal disease, are you? Is any one of you? And they said, no. She goes, that's when you you be nervous. You know what, Sean? It's so, it's so interesting because I asked you this specifically if it's your life or not because... Um, I, I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Go for I'll, it. I'll start it and you can stop All me right. if you want me All to right. stop. But I'm having a tough week. Yes. And I was going to go on air this week and I'm sitting there thinking like, I don't know how I do my job today. I yeah, literally don't yeah. know how I do my job today. And I remembered a story that you had told me during our last coaching session about when you went into tape. Um, I think it was for SpongeBob. Or, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I was doing uh, looping for SpongeBob. You were doing looping for SpongeBob, and you is it okay if yeah, I share? Go ahead. And you got a text as you were going in to like this in big the job in the yeah. hallway uh, that your dad had passed away. Yeah, my and brother you, texted me and said, "Yeah, he, you know, I knew he was." doing badly and he was getting into the hospital but we thought at least a couple weeks and i got it right before i walked in and then you went in and you did your job and i had to go in and do funny voices for a spongebob movie so this when i was sitting this it was a couple of mornings ago and i was like okay sean can do that i definitely can do this today yeah, so i mean listen if you have to if you don't have enough but i know you do probably in your own life definitely but you had just told me that now and, and that yeah. was really helpful for me just thinking perspective that put things in perspective for me like nobody just passed away yeah but like yes okay yeah and in in my spin to myself i remember saying my dad gave me a sense of humor he would love he would love, and he had a dark sense of humor, he would love that I'm going to voice a cartoon and find out he died right before it. I mean, <laughs> you know, he would yeah. think that's hilarious. He was turned me on to Monty Python, and what's more Monty Python than that? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, so, very true. So that was really, you know, but I had to do something mental to make myself through, to get myself through it. Right. And I knew he would be bummed if I said I can't do this and left. And I know they would have let me leave if I said my dad just passed away. Of course, of course. course they would have. But I know he didn't want that. And I needed the money and the work and the exposure for my family. And there's an old Jewish saying that if there's a crossroads and there is a wedding caravan and a funeral caravan pulling up at the exact same time, who goes first? And they said, always the The wedding. wedding. Because yeah. life goes first. And I know my dad would want me to live my life that day and do the cartoon. So, yeah, you can get through these things. So write down three things. And then whenever you're feeling like, oh, if my exercise doesn't go well in acting class, I'm going to get yelled at or I didn't memorize my line. Look at your perspective and go, you know what, I'll get through this. I can get through it. So it minimizes it. Another thing that's real simple. Gosh, this is the core to so much. When you see little toddlers... And they're going, you know, ape poop. I don't know if that's the best spin on that word. Ape crap. Ape crap. Is that better? Apish. They're going apish. Okay. (laughs) Uh, I think you know what I was trying to say, but I won't say it. Uh, You know, they're always tired or hungry 
or you cold. know, ex- cold or extremely uncomfortable. Guess when that changes? Never, never. We just learn how to handle it. My girlfriend and I, when she, we moved in, she was long distance for two years. She moved in, and we've had we'd have little spats about things. Well, w- after like six months, we finally broke it down and said, "Okay, no heavy discussions after 11. Like she has to get up. She gets up at like six in the morning for her job, so she goes to bed at ten. And it's sometimes it'll go a little later, but like. No heavy discussions after 1030 because then she gets all worked up and then I get all worked up because we're both tired. Uh, Or if you're really hungry or uh, I had kind of an anxious day a few months ago when I had this bad report from the dentist and I thought it was going to be something pretty heavy like maybe oral cancer or something like that. But it was because I was severely hungover from St. Patty's Day the day before. And once I was sitting there, you know, I was kind of freaked out at the dentist and I stopped and I go, dude. You were totally hungover from yesterday, yeah. <laughs> and that's why you're more sensitive, and that's why this is affecting you so much. So I thought, well, this is silly. So I went home, and I ate, and I exercised, and I felt a lot better. So that's a big useful thing is have a routine where you know you're well-fed, you know you're sleeping well, no exercise, guys. It really does kill anxiety. When I had my worst, worst anxiety that I was telling you about, I'd go to yoga classes, and after the yoga class, it would feel great the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. It was just hard getting out of bed to get to that class, but once I was there, it was great. Um, like I just spoke about, I rode the bike for 20 minutes, and I felt so much better. So build in a structure, a routine in your notebook when you go to bed, when you eat, and then you even have those questions when you're feeling really upset. Ask yourself, am I hungry? Am I tired? Am I uncomfortable? Am I hungover from St. Patrick's Day? Yeah, In always that ask order. that last yeah, question. Yeah, always ask the last one. It's the most important. So set a daily routine. Have that in your uh, no sweat notebook. So the most important, the are you still laughing about the physical sweat of the notebook? No, no, I'm just laughing. Uh, the hangover one is actually real, you know, when you say, especially for depression or whatever it yes. is, like you're more depressed if you're sitting there and you're thinking, and a lot of us artists do drink or yeah, we'll go out to unwind whatever afterwards. it is yes. that is yeah. your thing. Right. Uh, and then you wonder why you're so down and depleted and you think of all the other possible answers right. except for, oh, I got really drunk and now I'm not feeling very good because yes. it's a depressant. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I'm laughing about you checking that last one, but it's actually an important one in, in terms of the P's that you're talking about. Permanent, yeah. that yeah. is not permanent. That is that not feeling permanent. That feeling you feel right. is not permanent. And you have to say, you know what, I have to go. And they say that coffee really is good for hangovers or caffeine of some sort. So get yourself a cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, obviously hydrate. They say that's really good. Don't after drink as much the next time. Don't drink as much the next <laughs> time, but just check yourself if you're party. And and there was a time that after I drank, I would feel more depressed. Me too. Uh, Me too. In, as I got older, that never happened to me. I just felt lousy when I was younger. But as I got older, I felt more depressed and hopeless and sad. And I would have to go, oh, you know, but it was new. It never really happened to me that uh, way. Very similar to me, Sean. Very yeah. similar. And as you, you have got to, older. Yeah. And you yeah. have to kind of check in and be like, wait, this isn't real. The way yeah, I'm yeah, feeling yeah. right now is right. not it's real. It's an illusion. Yeah. So, Make sure you have that nice structure and ask yourself all those questions if you're feeling bad. Uh, there's tons of times that I felt really, really awful, and then I would go grab like two power bars and down them, and next thing you know, I was fine. And I told you before an audition, I have yeah. to feel physically full. I have to feel like I've eaten enough and drank enough water. And I'll sit in my car and just chug water. And, and I, I don't know why. And you have to feel empty. And you have to feel empty. I know. It's very strange, but you have to learn yourself or know yourself. But also learn yourself. Learn and know. So... This is the most important thing in your notebook. It was something I used when I had my first, I had a first anxiety attack in my late 20s, worked through it with a workbook that had the similar ideas from this. But then when I went, had my latest one a couple, few years ago, there's a fantastic book. I mentioned his name before, I think, Martin Seligman, called Learned Optimism. Now, it is the only self-help book from a psychology psychological point of view that's been proven through psychological testing and basically this book they said is more effective or these techniques are more effective than antidepressants or anything um, long term 
meaning permanence. A lot of people who go on antidepressants will have to go back on them later. But if you can master this kind of thinking, this learned optimism, then you will be in great shape. And i telling you, I have lived it. And everything that I have now is from this moment. And I was a constant warrior until I was 52 years old. So, uh, but of course, I'm only 37, so I'm in the future. Right. Time machine. Time machine. Uh, okay. So the basic premise is that we can refute our negative thinking. Okay. So it's an A, B, C, D, E structure. A is the antecedent. That means that's what happened. What happened was I was talking about my movie that I was so happy about. Roxy made a joke on the word, and then Jeff jumped in, and they started talking about sandwiches and moved away from my very important movie. So that's what happened. Now, that that's just a fact. That's true. That happened. That's just a fact. And so your you guys a, all just heard it. Your A is always a fact. Mm -hmm. It really is a fact. B is how you perceive it or, or what your conclusion is from what happened. So my conclusion... Wait, Sean, just to make sure. So the words don't all start with the letter of what no, they're no, going to no, be. No, 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 not okay. necessarily. You're right. Antecedent is right. B is the thing that I would say... What ha So that happened, and I would say, oh, they don't care about my movie. And, and, and so I told you, they read it. So I could even personalize that even more. They read it. They re didn't change the subject so fast. They rejected it. They don't actually like what I wrote. They were lying the whole time that they said they liked the script. So it's how you initially like take it. How you take it in a negative way. Okay. How you spin it, right? So that's the B. The C is then what, consequen what consequentially makes you feel. So I feel rejected and hurt. And I start thinking they I'm a crappy writer and they're just trying to amuse me. They don't really like anything I do. And when they say I'm really good at, you know, really creative and smart, they're lying. They're, I'm, I'm actually a fraud. And then you can obviously turn those with the three Ps. Well, I'm sure I'm always a fraud. They probably don't even want me on this podcast. Uh, permanence, like they probably always thought I was a loser. And uh, always will. Per, yeah, yeah, pervasiveness. That then this much mean if if they're lying to my face, maybe my girlfriend and my kids are lying to my face, and they hate me too. And you know, so and then what happens is B and C feed on each other. B and C be the way you perceived it and see the way you feel about it, and they start spinning out of control and just deepening. And if you ruminate, it gets even worse. Ruminating meaning we're thinking about it for longer than a minute. And the hardest part of that is you can't think your way out of it. You can't say like, oh, just stop thinking that because you've already started this train rolling. And it's really hard to get out of. And this is where most people live and get stuck and that's where it ends. At C? At B and C, A, B, and C. And what happened, and then a negative take on it, and then they're just spinning out of control. So what do we do? So you come in and refute that with D. So you're going to write down in your notebook, A, I would write down, you know, what happened, B, this is, you know, they must think I'm a loser, C, I'm always going to be a loser, and they're lying to my face, so everyone's lying to my face, blah, 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 blah. So D, you start to refute it, and you say... Okay, and write down facts that are true. Roxy and Jeff have known each other for a longer time than I've known them. They might have a banter about childhood things and fun things that I'm not really aware of. They're really honest people. They wouldn't take the time of talking about my script the way they did if they really didn't like it. The way they were talking to me, I am an actor, I can read behavior, it just seemed very genuine. It was probably just literally a fun moment from remembering their child. Like you just write all the things that refute it. So you refute, um, you refute the negative part of it and then you build up the positive side of it. In E? In, in D. This is all in oh, D. This is this all is this is different parts of D. And then you ref, then you give and then you bolster up the positive side. 
they've always been nice to me. They always spend time with me. They've never dismissed me. Um, we even saw each other at the Christmas party, and they were nice and introduced me, you know, Mr. Fantabulous and, and introduced me to his wife, and I don't think he would if he didn't. So you bolster up the positive side, and then you refute the negative side, and as a result, you start to feel better. And that's E, is the is instead of having the lousy feeling of C, you've now moved it to E and you feel better and you refute it. So what you do is you do this A, B, C, D, E. Just to recap, Sean, without the examples, will you go through A yes. through E? A is a factual thing that happens to you, okay? B is your perception of what has happened to you negatively. C is how you feel about that negative perception. B and C spin out of control that you can't think your way out of. D is the work that you put in your notebook to refute the negative uh, uh, B and C, to refute that that's probably not true. So here's another thing. And then E. And then E is, sorry, and then E is the result of feeling better from the refutations that you've done in D, refuting. And do you write anything down for E? Uh, you can. It's more that the feeling will come, but you, it's not a bad idea to write down, you know, after reading D, it's probably minimal. And you may not feel it, feel it immediately. It may take a while, you know, but the more you do this over and over and over again, then what happens is the moment to moment thing starts to happen. And they do that. And I go, oh, well, I wanted to talk about my script more. And they change it to sandwiches. Oh, well. And that was, do you know what I mean? And that's it. As I just thought about yeah. that instead of I ruminated about that negatively. Does that make sense? Yes. So, um, and you also can, Jeff, you feel bad about talking about sandwiches now or not yet? Uh, I a b I a through eat it. So I'm feeling okay. <laughs> you did. You yeah. felt, felt okay. I'm felt set. a little guilt on B and C for a minute. I'm for a minute, but yeah, yeah. and then you did <laughs> right. And and but it's a but it was so funny because as I was driving here, I was thinking, gosh, you know, I remember we, you and I had said something we had a, a similar discussion about this before and, and i thought and i thought god i need one and then when you guys did that i go oh that's it that's the perfect that's a perfect thing that someone who is sensitive or thinking um not positively or not um could spiral uh, about could spiral so here's another really important thing the definition of optimism is not rah rah you know tony robbins cheerlead pump yourself up that is not their definition it's just the absence of pessimism. Just not being pessimistic is enough. And you will see that you will be optimistic just if you get rid of pessimism. You don't need to get rid of pessimism and then be the happiest, brightest person in the world. It will just start to become that way. And the good news is, and they said it in the book, and I thought, ugh, it'll never happen. The more you do this, then that starts to spiral and you become positive and can get through negative things quickly. And I can tell you that is a fact. That absolutely is a fact. So it's a really, really effective step to break it down. It takes time. Write it with your hands. But I tell you, when I did it, I saw my notebook. I had like one every couple of hours, and then slowly it became one every, uh, you know, one every half a day, then one every couple days, then once a month, and then I didn't have to write them anymore because my trained my brain to react moment to moment and not make anything permanent or ruminate on it, ruminate it on a negative way. Here's when you want to ruminate on something good. Because my therapist told me, you know, he was saying to somebody, well, what do you think I'm supposed to just sit there and eat a donut and ruminate how great it is? And he goes, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And he goes, well, that's stupid. No one does that. And he goes, yes, you do. And he goes, yeah, when? And he goes, when that guy cuts you off in traffic. You'll ruminate on that guy for another three miles. I said, what a jerk. Why? So you are doing it. You're just doing it negatively. Negative yeah. Too. So we want to do that. So that's what I would do with my notebook. That's really important. What did you? What do you guys think of the A B C D E? I think it's great. I'm I'm curious timing wise. Like if I will, if something happened, if I'm able to pull out my notebook and do that, right? Uh, or like you do go to the bathroom or right. where in these situations, you're probably not always by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but you might have to feel it, live with it, table it, you know, sit in fire, and then when you get home, you do it. Okay. You know what I mean? 
That's what I would do. I, I if would, you're still I, thinking about it, yeah, because you've been ruminating. Because you've been ruminating, and that's the way to refute it. Um, other things that are just really basic uh, for uh, spe- specifically for auditions or acting classes. Of a great tip I got when I would shake when I was nervous. So if I had a paper, and you know, you can imagine this. You can see it on YouTube, but you can hear it. But you know, it would shake, and you'd hear it, and it would interfere with my audition. Um, and then later in my life, my legs started to shake. And so then when that started to shake, then everything looked like it was about to faint. And I thought, oh, God, what is happening? And, and this came up just a few times in my life for like a month or two. But the best thing that ever helped me the most was my therapist taught me how to lean into it. And so I would literally do my lines and he would say, exaggerate it to a crazy degree. And I would shake while I did my scene and someone would read the scene with me and I would be shaking and I would still have the emotion. I would still be grounded in what the reality of the scene was, but I'd be shaking so spastically that it just exaggerated it. So then when I went into my audition, your body kind of goes, oh, well, uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Like, it, this isn't even as shaky as when he did in the house. And right. it's over-exaggerating the shaking or the nerves. And you can even do this with the feeling of nerves. Think of some really scary stuff. Get yourself super, super nervous and then do the scene. And then feel it what it's like to be nervous during the scene, but still do the scene. And then when you get in there, you're probably not going to be as nervous, especially if you've pulled out your No Sweat Notebook and you've read your perspective anyway. Mm-hmm. Um and listen to my audition stuff, guys, too, the, the three audition episodes, because it talks about, like, their collaborators and they're there to be on your side. So that helps, too. So that's all in other um, auditioning episodes. Another great thing that helped me was pushing negativity to the side. Let's say you have that negative thought. Okay, so now this is a different way of dealing with the sandwiches. They don't like my, they don't like my um, script. script. But... You just said, I'm not, I'm not able to get to my notebook. So what you do is you have this bad moment. You're in a position where you can't write in your notebook. Take that visualization of that problem and put it to the left or right of you in your peripheral vision. There's So 90 degrees from 90 front. degrees. So factually, they say that if you try to say no to a negative feeling, it comes back harder. It actually fights harder when you try to fully dismiss it. If you literally put it to the side of you as if you're looking at a road and you know there's buildings to the side, you're just not looking at them. It's there. You acknowledge it's there, but you're just focusing on other things and just living with it, kind of sitting on your side view. There's facts, and I forget the clinical term of the part of the brain, but they say after 15 to 20 minutes, that will disappear if you just put it there and then focus on something else. That's how you deal with it until you get home to your notebook. But, man, that helped a lot, too, just putting it to the side. And is it the same with the black blob, or are you trying yeah, whatever, to picture whatever exactly? That ne- whatever works for you. Mine are always kind of like on a weird plate <laughs> for some reason. I'll put this kind of thing on a circular thing, and I'll just put it over here. And and it's like Do a you round picture movie people? theater. people? It depends on whatever the negative thing is. What if it's a, you know. So if it's the, this example with the sandwiches and yeah, your script. Yeah, for me, I would say the feeling of uh, the way you looked when you were leaning over and laughing with Jeff about the sandwiches. So I'd take that image and I'd put that over here. And like, it may, maybe I might hear it and stuff like that, but it's just over here. Mm. And then I would keep it there for a little while and then it disappears. So you're literally just putting it aside don't try to stop it stop it either let it flow by you like i said with the trees or just put it to the side till it disappears and you always with all of these things redirect redirect to something else well they say stay busy stay busy focus on something else focus on anything else so that is really really a good thing to do the other thing guys also you want to learn how to relax you want to learn how to relax how find an app, a meditation app. You can, I used to take valerian drops, which are just little drops before an audition. I would have my little vial and just go bing. And you know what? What is that? It's valerian. In your is, eyes or your mouth? In your mouth. It was just like little drops for anti-anxiety drops. And they didn't really do that much, but I was, then it became kind of like a crutch. Over the counter? Over the counter. You can get it at like Whole Foods or any, any drugstore usually. Um, um, I would do breathing exercises. 
Um, there's a great one that I do, a relaxation one where you breathe and then you uh, picture a balloon in your above your head and you put all your thoughts and let it, the thoughts go into the balloon and float away. There's so many different kinds of ways to have relaxation exercises. God, there's just apps galore. And there's no excuse not to Google it and find out what works for you. Anything that can work majorly, let's say you're doing a major play and you have to um, uh, get really calm, something like a half an hour one and even like a three minute one that you can find on an app right before you walk into an audition. You know, find ways to relax yourself physically and that will help the mind as well. And then more importantly... If you are in a really bad place, you know, there's sliding scale ones. There's students that will do therapy for very cheap. You can really use your resources. We've talked about this a lot. We use our computer a lot on this show. We talk about searching for acting classes Google, and stuff. Yeah. Google, find a therapist if you need one. Um, have a nice, strong support system, a family that you can talk to, talk to a friend. I, listen, there's, I would, there's even online therapists now that you can text with, yeah, you can, you can text with, with or FaceTime. Listen, I just my advice to you is not to put it on Facebook or Instagram. You know what I mean? I don't think you need to publicize your. Probably won't make you feel better. Won't make you feel better, and you know they're gonna you're gonna get you know we love yous with hearts, and that's not really that useful. Um, that's another really important thing. And if you have to, and I did for a little while, I because I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't eating and I had to have um, anti-anxiety, anti-depression medication that helped me eat and sleep. And I was on it for a year or so, and then I'm not on it anymore because I mastered the book. If you need it, I'm not, I'm not a big advocate for or against. I'm just saying, but if you can't function and so my problem was I wasn't eating enough or sleeping enough. So none of the mental stuff would work because I was too thin, too hungry, too tired. Mm -hmm. And so I just needed that boost and that helped me and that balanced me. And then I could do the work. It's always great if, you, but I would never say, please don't do medication only. You have to do the work, the work. while you're doing it. I completely agree, Sean. I've been, uh, so when I was younger, I was prescribed Xanax. I was okay. I was in really really awful shape. Mm -hmm. I was seeing a therapist. I was right. having extreme panic attacks. Pull over, can't breathe, lie outside on the floor, right. like shaking nonstop, thinking about yeah. horrible things. And, right. And it's I really believe it saved my life. And that's what medication is for. Like right. that, that in between time. Right. Where, when you're doing all of the work, but it hasn't set in yet, and you that's like the the thing that saves you yeah um and then knowing when you've done enough work to try to take your, um, a step back from that medication right but you can do that with a doctor's help not on your own yeah um, but yeah. definitely medication exists for a reason even though it's been incredibly abused if you need yes. something and yeah. you talk to a doctor and that's what they think you should try and you think so as well it's nothing to be ashamed of. I like to see it as an antibiotic when I've gotten, you know, a virus. I right. need it for a certain amount of time and then it made me got me what I needed and then I feel better and then I can get off it. Um, but some people need to, but they do say with this book that if you do read it, um, then and master it, then you don't need those things. Again, it worked for me. I'm not judging anybody on how they're helping themselves or making themselves feel better and i don't you know i'm not trying to you know how dare you i'm not i'm not making any money from this book i'm just saying that as you said at the top it worked for me and putting in that effort and putting in that work worked mm -hmm. for me and i was you know blessed with the time to do so um but i but i wasn't doing anything else because i couldn't get out of bed so if that you're doing that anyway, you may as well lay in bed with a notebook and read a, a good book that might help you. The other thing that's really interesting about all this is what if there is something that is true? What if there is something that's true? So what, what if, if Jeff and I actually what disliked What if you your and script? Jeff said to me, you know, later, I said, hey, it seemed like you didn't like my script. And I was like, dude, we don't really like it that much. It's not that, I mean, it's fine, but it's not as good as you think. And I, I don't know if you think you should shoot it, right? So then it's a fact. And my fears are true, right? But I know that this podcast helps a lot of people and helps a lot of actors and helps people navigate 
the you know a life as an actor in Hollywood, and I still want to do it. Well, it's not useful for me to think about what you guys care about the script or not. So if there's a guy disarming a bomb and he thinks, oh, I could explode if I screw this up, that is true. But it's not useful. It's not a useful thing to think about. The useful thing is how do I disengage it? Or if I'm in a lifeboat and looking at the ocean, do I say, I could drown in there? I could drown in there. Well, that's not useful. It's how do I fish in there to get a fish? Or how do I catch a seagull to eat? Or that's useful. So sometimes, how do I get back to land? Yeah, these are facts. Sometimes there are hard facts, but then you have to decide if they're useful or not. My teenage daughters hate that word all the time. Be- yeah, oh, because I say it all the time. And they are like, well, that's just the... And I'll say, well, that's not really useful to think about, is it? It's not going to help the situation. It does nothing for you. Sometimes they're there to vent, and that's fine. That's another really good tip, guys, if you're in a class or in a relationship, friends. You start telling me something, and I say, do you want a solution, or do you just want to vent? Right. I do and that all the do time, do that too. all the time. Like, it's a really, really good tip. But, you know, sometimes they'll be just negative and it'll be going on too long. And I say, guys, this isn't useful. And on the opposite side of that, I've now started my sentences with which one of those. So if I'm calling somebody for a specific reason, I'll say, hey, just to vent for a second. Yes. And then I'll say it. Yes. Or I'll say, hey, I need some advice. Right. Because then they know what to do. So on yeah. both ends of that. Yeah. So these are all really good tips. The usefulness is great. Ask yourself all the time if what you're doing is useful. And and the thing that helped me the most is that ruminating is thinking about something for over a minute. Man, you You've catch yourself. About, yeah. yeah, you catch yourself ruminating all the time. So this is one of my most important shows to me because it is very personal. I went through a very scary time and I was able to get out of it. And I just want to share that with as many people because it's it's just a hard business sometimes. And we have to separate the biz. You know, we have to be vulnerable in the craft, but then we have to be tough skinned in the business and you have to know the difference. So all these things, if you put them into place, you know, will work. What do you, what do you think rocks would be that that you would take out of these tips that you think is the most useful for you i think that the most the most hands-on is a b c d e yeah it's so uh, good yeah it's a really good one it's um, really great and it's a great but guys they outline it very specifically in the book again it's called learn optimism by martin seligman really great book and so you would you would that's a practice i want to start implementing uh because my biggest one is permanent yeah. And oh, I have such a hard time with that when you're thinking so, it's forever. When you are so dark in something and you're like, well, this is just how it's always going to be. Right. And it's just not true. Right. Um, Got it. There, there's so many things that you think are permanent that are, are, are not, not permanent. permanent. Nothing. For, for better or worse. Right. For uh, better or worse. So it's really, you know, live your life moment to moment. You know, do the work, do the work. And, and I bring this up also because I've had students that were just phenomenal actors. And I really wanted to help them, but because they were so insecure or wanted constant validation or, you know, came at me with mental issues that they didn't address, it was making my life really hard to work with them. And so, you know, a director would come and say, hey, I'd love to use a couple of your students in my film. And I would not pick them. Yeah. Because they don't have that part taken care of. It's so important to take care of that. Another Sean's week, I did finally meet with the CBS producer of Magnum P.I. and um, Hawaii Five-0 and that's MacGyver. Amazing. We finally had our meeting. It's taken us seven months to get the meeting on the books, but that's one of the things we talked about. He said, yeah, the people who are – the reason I called you back after 20 years was because you were great to work with and you were professional and you were a pleasure. If you weren't, I never would have called you. Right. And that was a job I got 20 years later with a phone call. Fact. Yeah, fact. That is a fact. So this needs to be taken care of. Take care of yourself physically. Get your rest. Get your exercise. Get your vitamins. Eat, make vitamins. Eat. Make sure you're that way. And then take care of your mental. It will affect everything. So... Where can we find you, Roxy? Everywhere at Roxy Stryer. Mr. Funtabulous Jeff Graham. Guys, you can find me everywhere at Jeffrey C. Graham. 
And you can find me at that guy SMW on Instagram and Sean Whalen Peeps on Facebook. Take care of yourself and thank you for letting me be part of your journey. Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> the views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.